I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. Hello, this is Julian Charles of TheMindRenewed.com, podcasting to you from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. And it's great to have with me here on the line on this uh, 4th of December 2012, Mr. Chris White, all the way from Nashville, Tennessee. Chris White is the creative force behind a large number of documentaries, or as they've become known, debunkumentaries, which analyze and then debunk the claims made by various people in their books and documentaries, which he feels require a rigorous response in the pursuit of truth. And among many other projects, he has responses to David Icke, Jordan Maxwell, Michael Tazarian, the first Zeitgeist film, Zeitgeist the movie, and most recently, a lengthy and, I have to say, very professionally produced debunkumentary on the History Channel series Ancient Aliens, called, logically enough, Ancient Aliens Debunked. So, Chris, I know you're a very busy man, so thank you very much for sparing the time to talk with me on The Mind Renewed. Hey, Julian, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and that's a, that was a pretty well-put-together intro, I must say. I feel like I'm a, i got to be professional and stuff now, so <laughs> I'll try my best. Don't feel that, no. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the reason why I first contacted you was to ask you, of course, about this zeitgeist, the movie which you debunked, and uh, where you basically take apart the claims made there that Jesus is essentially a mythical character. But since then, I've looked at some of your other work, and obviously I want to ask you about that as well. But before we get on to that, I think it would be good if you could just say a little bit about yourself, just to give an idea as to where you're coming from on all this. Sure. Well, almost everything that you mentioned there is something that I at one time believed. I more or less believed the zeitgeist version of history at one time, the ancient astronaut theory, which the ancient uh, alien series is promoting. David Icke, Jordan Maxwell, a lot of that stuff to larger or smaller degrees, I believed their their doctrine. Mm. So looking back on it, I guess that after I myself figured out that uh, that it was sort of cleverly devised untruths, it was it was a burden for me to to do this kind of thing. So it's kind of been a a drive to do this. That's the thing that that keeps me going with all this stuff is that I just feel like I I need to warn other people that were just like I was um, deceived by a lot of these ideas. And you came to believe in Christ, didn't you? Was that through this process of, of learning about these things that you'd encountered? Yeah, in in a sense, I would, I, I guess if you would have asked me back then, I probably, well, it depends on when you ask me. I, most of my growing up, I probably would have told you that I believed that, you know, in the gospel to a degree. But then after, especially after I got into the, the early Zeitgeist stuff, it was before the movie came out. But then I kind of threw all that away. And I'm not sure I really ever had anything more than an intellectual sort of agreement with it. But after this, once I saw the, obviously once once finding out that it was a concerted sort of effort to deceive people about this guy that lived 2000 years ago, it really just made me question a lot more and to dig in a lot more. It was then grounded in a lot of facts, but there was still a heart level thing that was almost completely distinct from any of the learning aspect of it that I sort of decided to follow Christ at some point in my heart. And I think that that was a bigger and broader thing that happened, but but it certainly was as a result of this in, in some ways. Yeah. Uh, it was one of the things that I really like about your work is that it's very, very analytical. I mean, you, you take the claims and you examine them in their, their own terms. And if they claim to do something historical, where well, you look for the history behind it, and if they claim to get something from logic, so you examine the logic. Is there anyone or anything that's influenced you in the way you approach this kind of thing? I don't know if I consciously do it that way. I'm not sure I really put any kind of methodological, you know, sort of macro purpose behind it. But I do think that if I was to describe how I would do it, it would be trying to understand it really, really well. Well, nowadays, I wouldn't say this was true at the very beginning, but nowadays, if I'm trying to refute something or whatever, I will go through a lengthy process of just learning about it, not really caring where the learning is going. Uh, Einstein once said, if you can't explain something simply, then you don't understand it well enough. Mm. And so I just try to soak it all in for a long time and then 
that helps me take the claims, I think, and just explain. And that's the way I would think of it. It's just what's most important about what's being said. Yeah. So in a sense, you're, you're giving it a chance to convince you, but you're choosing not to accept it when you've analyzed it through. Right. But I do. I would say that there are several instances where, you know, if something is true and you apply that method to it, you know, you have to be honest when you've come to something that that is true. Yeah. Uh, and there are many occasions where I had something written down, um, for example, in the recent one, uh, The Ancient Aliens Debunked, where, you know, I was going at it a particular way. And this is also true with uh, with recent studies and, and just about Bible prophecy and different things like that. You know, I, I want I have a presupposition that I'm kind of going with. But then if through, you know, the exegesis of it, you know, it's just not there. And it's important to to know when when it's not true. But I think that that's that's a epistemological thing that all of us could benefit from and that nobody does, including myself, that is to come to things with a lot of emotion. Jesus being at the top of that list, nobody really comes to a topic about Jesus without any uh, presupposition. And really being willing to look at both sides of the equation. I would say that it's so hard if you believe one way, let's say you're a mythicist and you want to believe this other way, you're not really going to go delve deep into the apologetics literature and find like who's the best in apologetics about this particular issue and go study him because that's not really appropriate to what you're wanting to do. But the, the thing about Christianity is that it is true. And so you, we don't have to be afraid with the most rigorous uh, learning and, and listening to both sides, because it yeah. just ends up in the long run making us uh, uh, more informed and better to explain the truth to people. Yeah, I think it's a very good message to give out, because a lot of people do seem to be frightened, don't they, about investigating things, because they think that, that their faith is going to be disproved in some way. And I think that's that's quite an unhealthy situation to be in, really. Very much so. I think, it, and that's the good thing about Christianity. And over the over the years of being involved in these kinds of things and having, you know, a hostile uh, audience for the most part, yeah. uh, I get a lot of uh, emails that are negative or, or accusatory or challenging. And uh, so over the years, I've had a really, and I look back at it as a great opportunity to be confronted with all these really tough intellectual arguments, which if true, really makes Christianity untrue. So I've had the opportunity to test it over and over and over again and say, well, you know, I need to look that up and find out what the truth is about that. And every time there is a logical explanation, at, if you dig deep enough, without it, you're not even mm. trying to get there. It's just a matter of learning about it. And you'll find out that the person who making this claim is it's wrong and for some reason or another. Yeah, I noticed that business about this, the negative responses that you get from some of your material. I looked on YouTube and there is like over 50 percent of the people have said they don't like it. <laughs> well, YouTube is a, another animal altogether. I don't know what it is about YouTube. It just brings out the worst of people in, in, in 200 <laughs> characters or less or whatever it, it does, is. It does, isn't it? It's amazing. Yeah. OK, so uh, moving on to your response to Zeitgeist, the first Zeitgeist movie, which you call uh, Zeitgeist History Rewritten. And I certainly recommend everybody takes a look at that. As I said before, you take apart the claims made there that Jesus actually never existed, that he's a mythological character sort of cobbled together from various pagan sources. Now, before we talk about that, I don't know whether my listeners actually have heard these claims. So we'll just hear a short extract from where Zeitgeist claims that Jesus bears amazing resemblance to the Egyptian god Horus. Broadly speaking, the story of Horus is as follows. Horus was born on December 25th of the Virgin Isis, Mary. His birth was accompanied by a star in the east, and upon his birth he was adored by three kings. At the age of 12 he was a prodigal child teacher, and at the age of 30 he was baptized by a figure known as Anup, and thus began his ministry. Horus had 12 disciples he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick and walking on water. Horus was known by many gestural names such as the Truth, the Light, God's Anointed Son, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God, and many others. After being betrayed by Typhon, Horus was crucified, buried for three days, and thus resurrected. Okay, then goes on to draw supposed parallels between Jesus and lots of other pagan deities as well. So could you talk us through your response to this supposed Horus-Jesus parallel? Sure. Listening to that just really is uh, is frustrating because those are just total lies. There's not really a good way around that. They're presenting this as, 
hey, everybody, you haven't read the Egyptian text, but I have. And Horus was born on December 25th and, you know, was crucified and buried three days and resurrected, had 12 disciples, all this stuff. Mm. And the unsuspecting listener will be like, wow, this person, I never knew that Horus had done all that stuff. It's, it's very convincing the way it's done. All that nice music behind and it's sort of authoritatively spoken, isn't it? It's the authoritative part that I think, you know, it's like Hitler said, you know, speak a lie boldly or whatever, however he says it, big lies. Yeah. And people will believe it. People don't like to question things that are so authoritatively spoken. Uh, it's like, well, I don't need to look that up. That's just true. Like I said it like it was that would be a bold lie. But anyway, so this has been challenged by many different people. And you can look up the various refutations to it. I'll go through a few of them. Horus was born on December 25th. There is nothing anywhere that says that Horus was born on December 25th. When pressed in a in a, and I did a something called what did I call that? It was Peter Joseph and Achari S doing a radio interview. The the real Zeitgeist challenge debunked. Okay, so that's what it was called. So Peter Joseph made Achari S put out this thing called the Real Zeitgeist Challenge, which was a response to my Zeitgeist Challenge. So I put out a video called The Real Zeitgeist Challenge Debunked, in which I essentially responded point by point to her responding to the Zeitgeist Challenge. So what Good I'm about heavens. to say – Right. <laughs> all right. So what I'm about to say to a lot of this is sort of that, as I mentioned, that sort of second tier issue. So December 25th. So the, the first thing you would say is that nowhere in the Egyptian text is, is Horace ever said to have been born on December 25th, and you move on. That's where the first level is. And then they come back and say, well, that's true. He was never born on December 25th, but – in some later traditions, Horus was came to be viewed as the sun, and the sun rose every day. Therefore, the sun was considered to be born every day of the year, December 25th being one of those days. So, like, it could have been any day. Right. So, <laughs> August 21st is just as right of an answer. Uh, my birthday is as December 25th. That, and that, this is what was crazy about this. This is what sh she came back with, right? And she's, of course, the uh, consultant, uh, so, so-called, of, of the Zeitgeist movie. So is she an Egyptologist herself? N no. No, she just uh, she is just a writer, as far as I know. She has done some, some archaeological digs and things like that. She's got pictures of her doing them. I'm not sure to what degree she is accredited in those. But I yeah. don't think anything. Mm. But there are very few mythicists in any kind of university setting. There's less than five in the world. What I'm trying to say is that everybody that's anywhere close to respectable that holds something close to a mythicist position, which there aren't many, everybody looks at Achari S like, okay, well, that's completely crazy. And that's what we're looking at with Zeitgeist, a sort of embodiment of Achari S's version of this. Anyway, so continuing, his birth was accompanied by a star in the east. This is sort of a convoluted, of course, the first tier of this is no, it wasn't, you know, accompanied by a star in the east. And there's nothing in the Egyptian records that would say that. But then we go into this idea. Well, they go through this thing and they say that these three stars in the sky and the Orion's belt were representative of the three kings and that the star Sirius was represented as uh, the, the north star that pointed to the rising sun on December 25th. It's a long, convoluted thing. There are many, many problems with this. First being that, that they didn't call these stars the three kings, first of all. Second of all, that star that they're supposedly following is not in the east. It would be in the west. If you look at Ryan's belt, it's actually on the left side, if you will. So it's, they would be following in the wrong direction. They don't align just on December 25th. They're aligned every day of the year, and they point to the sun in that way, if you want to call it that, for at least half the year. Uh, well, I would say about three or four months. This kind of was birthed out of some early books by a guy named Gerald Massey and Kersey Graves, both of whom were spiritists. That is, they were contacting spirits, and, and none of these guys were, to make a long story short, this is where she's getting this stuff from, people that were that were not citing sources, that were just saying this kind of stuff. So to continue real briefly, uh, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't at the age of 12. He didn't become a prodigal teacher. He wasn't baptized at 30. All this stuff is completely untrue. Uh, he certainly wasn't crucified. And what she says to that is that there is a picture of Osiris, the, the Jed pillar in cruciform, uh, which is, has the two arms that are usually crossed over the Jed pillar. And so she says she takes that to mean Horus, not Osiris, was crucified. And that has nothing to do with crucifixion then, really. It's, it's just the shape that's similar. Right. I mean, and plus, I mean, crucifixion wasn't invented, you know, for much, much later. Um, anyway, we could talk about all those different issues, but it's just amazing that every time they say something that, oh, yeah, he was 
you know, had 12 disciples and you're and you come back to them and say, um, Horace didn't have 12 disciples. And they're like, yeah, I know. But if you look at it like this and you squint your eyes and whatever else, you know, then he might have. And you're like, no, I- even then it doesn't. So everything that they say is true. So authoritatively, when pressed, they themselves admit that there is nothing that they could cite in the ancient Egyptian text that would say that Horace, you know, was born on December 25th or was born of a virgin and all these different things. The born of a virgin thing is, is another issue, but I go into in great detail in the, the Real Zeitgeist Challenge debunked video. To make a long story short, he wasn't born of a virgin. Same thing is true. They said this of of all these, you know, like Krishna was born of a virgin and everything else, which Krishna's mother had seven children before she had Krishna. It's just a it's just a mess. Well, one point that you make really effectively is that their historical arguments. Um, well, they're not really historical arguments at all. They come from this what you call astro theological beliefs. What are those? How do they influence the movie? Oh, very much so. I mean, astrotheology is this view that the stories of the Bible, the story of Jesus, he wasn't a he wasn't a real person at all, but the stories of him are just allegorical stories that reflect things that were happening in uh, in the stars and zodiacal mm. configurations and so on. So, for example, they would say um, Moses represented the age of uh the ram is it and anyway they have all these different things things and say jesus is the age of pisces and so going into the new age of aquarius we get to sort of get rid of jesus finally and go into whatever is next and that's really the heart of what the new age is is that you get to be done with jesus in the age of aquarius and i think that's why i mean this is so problematic because what they're talking about this idea that this concept of an age. Now, procession, it was known about for a long time. The Greeks, way before the first century, had had understood the concept of procession, this 26,000-year cycle that was the wobble of the Earth on its axis, which caused the perception of the stars to change in the horizon. That is old. But the concept that on the solstice, when the sun would rise, whatever constellation would have been behind the sun at that time was whatever age we were in that is a really recent invention like of the 19th century mm-hmm. and Noel Swerdlow who was a history of, astro- of astronomy and Chicago I think it's uh, University of Chicago he, he points this out pretty effectively that there is no possibility that the writers in the first century were trying to tell us that the age of Pisces what Jesus was represented by the age of Pisces because that concept was nowhere known in the ancient times it was a recent modern invention this actually changes so much of the of the new age concept of their 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 view of the the world because everything falls apart if you can hit that one point that none of this actually matters because they couldn't have possibly had an age concept age of pisces or a coming age of aquarius or the age of and and, and there's a lot of problems within that for example they try to say that that moses was the ram no, Abraham was the age of the ram, which which is funny because they say it's Abraham, the ram, and they don't rhyme, actually, except in English. The word for ram in Hebrew is ariel or something like that. There's all kinds of problems. For example, the idea that Jesus is uh, age of Pisces really comes from the story that he fed multitudes with two fish and a certain number of loaves. I think it's five loaves in that version. But what they don't tell you is that just a few pages later, in the same book, Jesus does the same thing with a different number of fishes and a different number of loaves. They never tell you about that one because it makes the whole thing fall apart. So they're saying that whoever it was constructed the New Testament text then in order to reflect these astrological stories. So these codes are embedded in the New Testament text. Is that what they're saying? That's exactly it, yeah. And yet they're not consistent. <laughs> well, and, and that's just it. I mean, every one of them sound good until you start to really dig into it. You see this in so many different – they need to pin Jesus to the age of Pisces. They need to make him do that. And the way that they do it is – like Jordan Maxwell, is, is he always says this when he's trying to do this particular th- very important thing in the New Age. He says that Jesus was the fisher king. Of course, Jesus wasn't a fisherman. Uh, he was never called the Fisher King. You know, he had his some of his disciples were fishermen. That's the best you can do. Then they'll try to say the Jesus fish on the back of cars. That's the the big you know gotcha there. You know, well, well, he's clearly a fish. Um, you know, it's a Greek acrostic which, which represented the first letter in a, in 
the I, which stood for an acronym that early Christians used for a place of meeting. And it has nothing to do with, you know, being a fish or them thinking that he was a fish or anything like that. And so on and so forth. The next closest thing and the only one that I really know of that they try to do that with is trying to say that the Pope hat with the mitre there is, you know, based off an ancient Dogon thing. And, of course, that has about as much to do with Jesus as, (laughs) you know, whatever. But in the minds of people, that works. You know, in the minds of people, they, they, they show the Jesus fish on the car. They tell you he was the fisher king, and they show the Pope hat, and it's a done deal. Jesus is the age of Pisces. And when the age of Aquarius comes, you know, Jesus is done. And really, I think the thing is, is that when we go to the next age, whenever that is, and however that, that shakes down as far as they're concerned, then there will be some people that really, they're still stuck in the old age, that Jesus age. And they're going to be holding us back from the real evolution of the new age where we can have new, great, awesome, warless, kumbaya sort of time. Yeah, sure. I want to ask you more about that in a bit, actually. The thing that uh, I find very difficult about all that you've just been talking about here is that from a biblical studies point of view, I, I cannot you know, I cannot even make sense of the claim that somebody would have presumably invented the whole of Jewish history and Christian history in order to tell these astrological stories when the kind of history that they then develop is quite antagonistic towards astrology. If you, know, if you actually read it through, there are all sorts of warnings about not being involved with astrology. I mean, I don't even understand how this makes any historical sense whatsoever. Well, that's why, histori- that's why you'll find no historian mythicist. And that's why even people that are agnostic, atheist historians at the university level, uh, save literally one that I know of, it would even entertain such a notion because this works only in a state of complete ignorance of how we do history. To say that the person of Jesus didn't exist as his historical person in light of the tremendous amount of evidence that we have that he did. Now, you can argue whether or not he claimed to be God or so on and so forth. But the fact that he exists, I just got done reading a book by a guy named a very critical person, a uh, critical scholar, Bart Ehrman, who oh, yeah. was mm-hmm. infamous for his uh, very critical look and saying that Jesus didn't claim to be God and so on and so forth, certainly not a Christian. And he has just written a book on the historicity of Jesus Christ, saying, you know, showing that, that there are no scholars that believe this, and he shows why. Now, I don't agree with much of what he has to say in terms of of who the historical Jesus really was. But his point is simply this, that there was an historical person in in first century Palestine that started a the religion we know as Christianity today is not under any doubt by atheists, you know, historian scholars, agnostic historian scholars, or anyone else that are, you know, that are into this. And if we say that we can't tell if Jesus is a true historical figure or not, considering that we have more evidence for him that we do for the most famous person in the first century, you know, Tiberi- his contemporary, Tiberius Caesar, and non-biblical st- records, then, then we have to not only make Tiberius Caesar, but everybody else that existed pretty much for hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, not existent either. And no historian would, of course, agree that that's how we do history. Yeah, well, I very much agree with that. But the Zeitgeist movie itself says something like all that evidence that's non-biblical evidence from the past has all been discredited. Sure, there's like, that's the final trump card when you say, well, yeah, but this person was antagonistic and this is in every copy of Tacitus that we know of. And, you know, there's no evidence of of forging in any way. Their trump card is, well, it was just forged. I mean, with no evidence, no, like Tacitus is a good example, the most, most famous historian of the time. And he, we have a very clear indication from him of the basics that Jesus, you know, was crucified by Pontius Pilate. He was the founder of the Christian religion. You know, these kinds of very basic sort of things. Uh, very antagonistic towards it. Obviously, he is not he's not looking at it in a good light. And it's in every copy of Tacitus that we have, annals uh, that we have from him. And he's not a person that would take this in hearsay, I mean, you, at, at all. But we could go on and on to these people that never, you know, this is what, what's, what's interesting to me, is that this idea that he didn't exist as, as an historical person didn't show up till the Enlightenment period of around the 1700s. And of all the enemies that Jesus had prior to the 1700s that were prolific writers and so on and so forth, Jewish people, Gentiles, the Romans. There's a lot of people that that really were threatened by Christianity. Nobody thought to simply say that he didn't exist. You know, the the best (laughs) argument ever 
uh, you know, the Talmud could have said, you know, instead of trying to say that, oh, well, his miracles were just parlor tricks, pay no attention to him. Mm. He, you know, he was born of a of a, a harlot and all this other stuff that the Talmud says, you know, it could have simply said these people just made up this guy and made up this this idea. I mean, he never exists. Nobody ever remembers him. Sure. When we start to actually talk about what we know in terms of the the biblical literature, for example, uh, or or people like Josephus is a good example to answer your question about forgeries. But just to be quick, the the early material around the the time of like the 30s or 40s or, or even a little later, that is a time where if you were trying to make these claims, which are bold face historical, Luke says, you know, he's writing to. Uh, the emperor saying, I thought it good to to write these things out, to make an orderly account of the things that, you know, I've interviewed. This is a, a, an absolute declaration of I am writing to you an historical account, as all all of them were. There would be so much uproar if you if you showed this to the town of Galilee, that grandpa would say, uh, where did this come from? You know, this is a complete nonsense. Nobody remembers this guy. Jesus, trust me, I would have remembered if somebody came in here and they raised the dead and they, they you know, there would be there. Were, if it was true that he didn't exist, there would be something somewhere among all his enemies that just simply would say, you know, I don't even think he existed. But for some reason, nobody even thought of it until the 1700s when there was absolutely no way that they could have known one way or the other. But <laughs> yeah. To answer your question, like Josephus is a good one that they'll say is a forgery. It's it's just interesting about Josephus is that he is the only writer that we know of in first century Palestine that could have that could have done this. Um, There's one mention of another writer that existed that could have, you know, a writer of of histories that could have possibly mentioned Jesus. But we don't have any of his writings available. Josephus is the only writer in the entire first century Palestine. The historian that could have, despite what Zeitgeist says, by the way, they say there's like 30, 40, and you go through that list and it's a big mess and I could just describe it later on. But anyway, there's a great book out there by a guy named David Anderson called Myth that goes through those point by point. Anyway, Josephus, part of his has had some sort of interpolation and notable parts where it calls, instead of just the fact that Jesus was Jesus existed, he was crucified by Pontius Pilate, all these things are mentioned, but there are these little scribal notes that say he was the Christ as opposed to claimed to be the Christ. So it's widely accepted that Josephus did write about Jesus, but the idea that he was the Christ instead of simply claimed to be the Christ, those things were added. In another instance in Josephus, he mentions Jesus again. He mentions uh, his brother being killed and talks about Jesus in that regard. And that is not contested by any scholar of Josephus or anybody else. This is exists in all copies of Josephus. He did write about Jesus as a historical person. He certainly probably didn't think he was the Christ. And the reason why that interpolation probably existed is because uh, Josephus was sort of an outcast in the Jewish world because he was sort of a turncoat to the Romans. He kind of you know, joined the Roman side. He wrote most of his, his histories from the palace in Rome. So he was not well preserved by the Jews. And so that's why there are a lot of Christian scribes that were involved in the in that. So I, I understand about Josephus because there is a genuine reason, but we certainly don't need Josephus. We have plenty of other non-biblical historians and just antagonistic people that are mentioning Jesus, hostile witnesses, as they are called. And in fact, there is an Arabic version, isn't there, of the uh, Antiquities, which doesn't include that interpolation. Very good. Yeah, that's true. And and so because we have that and because we have the others, that's where it becomes clear that Josephus did write about this. He just didn't call him the Christ. And so, you know, it was like mm. when they say, and everybody knows that Josephus was forged, so we can throw that away. It's just one more in the big list of lies that that section includes. And, you know, really, uh, the, the movie Zeitgeist spends a very small time on this issue of the non-biblical uh, historical evidence for Jesus. It's, it's really unfortunate because that's really where I think that the important part uh, would need to be addressed if you're going to propose what they're proposing. Of course, they had no intention of doing a, uh, you know, a fair job with this. But Yeah, and you've created a website, haven't you, called the Zeitgeist Challenge. Did you set that up around the same sort of time when this film came out? Yeah, just about a few months after it came out, I put out a video early on. And at the time, I didn't know how to make websites, but a friend of mine put this up later. And uh, and so now I've taken control of it and everything. But And you've, you've issued this challenge to the world then to actually come up with some real evidence to support these claims. Yeah, it's as simple as just give some kind of 
pre-Christian source for the claims of Zeitgeist. And you've been you've been inundated with responses, I guess. Uh, no, I haven't been inundated with. <laughs> uh, I can really say there's only been one person who has given anything close to an actual response, and even then, they didn't. They answered like maybe three or four of these questions and uh and and, you know i think there's like 23 or something of them and i i haven't even gone through it in meticulous detail because you know in order to meet the challenge they have to answer the questions and so that's the closest it's come most people will write me and say oh i'm going to you know answer this i'll give you something tomorrow or whatever and i never hear back from them and you know so that's the main thing a lot of people that are sure of themselves initially email and then i never hear back from anybody and that's hopefully accomplishing what i wanted to do with this website, which is to show people that were sure of themselves that if they actually went and looked for this stuff in the pre-Christian texts about these gods, that these claims don't exist. And that was my burden. The reason I actually did this was because I was sort of in the conspiracy counterculture at the time, and still am to a degree, a lot of those people I just considered, you know, my friends and fellow, you know, seekers of truth. And when this movie came out, I had just been in a position to find out that a lot of this stuff, these basic claims were not true. So I, on the forums and things, I would try to tell people that this was, wasn't true. It was something that had been debunked 100 years ago. And people had set aside back then. It's just only popularized now because of this movie and all this stuff. And I really, in a lot of ways, became sort of enemy number one in the conspiracy counterculture because they just couldn't believe it. And it became like, yo, you just can't handle this because it messes with your beliefs. But we all know it. This is why I did to actually get their attention. It's like, look, I will give you a thousand dollars if you can prove this because everybody's so sure that they can prove it. Why don't you just do it? And here's, you know, here's the incentive. So that's that's where it came from. Would it be okay if I asked you a bit now about your Ancient Aliens Debunked uh, video? Sure. Because this is a response to the Ancient Aliens series from the History Channel, isn't it? And I have to admit, I haven't actually seen any of this series. I hadn't even heard of it before I came across your work, actually. But to to be quite honest, I am absolutely amazed that an institution like the History Channel should even take seriously on the, the kind of flimsy evidence that's there, this... This idea that ancient civilizations were visited by aliens and you know, perhaps humanity was genetically engineered by extraterrestrials, all this kind of thing. And they, they even bring on Eric von Däniken, don't they, as an authority, which I, I thought was amazing because I thought he was history, to be honest. You know, I haven't heard of him for years and years and years. And yet he's brought on as this great authority. And um, you do a, a great job of pointing out the inaccuracy and the, the falsehoods of these claims. So could you tell us just briefly about that series itself? And the uh, the holes that you found in these arguments they're bringing forth. Sure. Well, the Ancient Alien series uh, on the History Channel, well, it's been, I think now, it's in its fifth season. And it is really wildly popular over here. And it basically just promotes the ancient astronaut theory, which is, as you mentioned, the idea that aliens in our distant past came here. They influenced history in various ways, including texts and artifacts and building monuments such as the pyramids and so on and so forth though to be fair they would say that the aliens didn't build the pyramids they just gave us the technology to build them and they would promote ideas such as you mentioned that the aliens seeded mankind through genetic manipulation and so forth and it is a travesty that the history channel has put this forward but i've long since lost hope in the history channel and their promotion of all kinds of things the history channel actually has a very anti-christian agenda one of the presidents or not the president of it um she is the same woman who produced jesus camp which is a very very inflammatory bad video about christians it's something that has been showing up in history channel's agenda for a while but and i've watched enough ancient aliens now to know for sure that every episode has that spin on it somehow or some way. It's not about any other religion. It's not about any other thing. Mm -hmm. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about the Bible. It's about the God of the Bible. It sounds almost too crazy, but it comes up in every show, and, and trust me, I've seen a lot of them, that the God of the Bible was actually an evil alien, and he just wants what's bad for us. Anyway, the savior of the whole thing was was those that genetically modified us. They were the the ones that just represented by the serpent in the Garden of Eden that that wanted us to have the apple of knowledge and to bring us to a different state. And it's that serpent that that Prometheus, as they would uh, term, in fact, the name of the production company that produced Ancient Aliens is called Prometheus. It's him that really is our creator and, and true God. It's a very Luciferian doctrine. 
Absolutely. I thought this just smacks of the Gnostics straight away as soon as you said it. Yeah, it's Gnosticism through and through. But the, the it's all subtle. It's not something people w- that you believed in the ancient astronaut theory would, would say right away. But And I don't know if that's the major agenda to get them to, to that point. But the major agenda, I think, is just to get people to abandon their faith. And that's what the ancient astronaut theory did for me those many years ago when I read Zachariah Sitchin's book, uh, The Stairway to Heaven. Uh, really put me on it was for the first thing that put me on that path to um, that and and I would say that to be honest they make a lot of claims that are just really 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 hard to disprove because they take a lot of research to find out you know and because there's a lot of uncertainty about how certain things were done in the ancient past how bailback the trilithon stones at bailback were placed they essentially say because we don't know it's the possibility of aliens. You know, the one thing about genetic modification, it, it's not so fringe in, because this is also something that a person like Richard Dawkins has promoted the idea in the, the movie uh, that Ben Stein did. What's it called? Expelled. He promotes at the end of that, that that he is OK You know, to explain essentially a major problem to any evolutionist. That is the DNA. How exactly did this major information sequence just pop up out of nowhere? To that, Dawkins says, well, it's certainly possible that it could be aliens. That honestly is their best answer. So I see this as really a insurance policy for Darwinism, because once Darwinism, and I, I imagine it won't be too long before they have to admit that there are serious problems. Once Darwinism yeah. goes out in terms of the DNA, particularly, uh, they'll move to something that is more or less like this, as I think Dawkins was already on the forefront of. Yeah, it does seem to undercut the intelligent design inference, doesn't it? So rather than making that, but obviously with intelligent design, you make an inference to design and then you can go beyond science to a philosophical inference to, well, in our case, we would say, well, it's God who did it. Here, there's the option to say, ah, but no, it was the aliens that did it. Do you think there's that that kind of agenda behind that as well? The ancient aliens idea at its core is extremely naturalistic. I mean, it certainly is pseudoscientific, but it's not it's not supernatural. It's very, very naturalistic. Everything can be explained by super technology from gods that evolved like we did somewhere else and came here and showed us how to do this stuff with technology. So when when the Bible says something supernatural happened or when some ancient people describe something supernatural that's happening, they say, oh, no, no, no. What they're actually referring to is you know, something natural that came here. So it's it's a way to sort of do away with any kind of supernatural uh, explanation to things. And so that's why I think that it also is appealing to anybody that holds a naturalistic worldview. Why do you think audiences are ready to swallow this kind of thing? I mean, some of the stuff that uh, right at the beginning of your movie, there was this section about uh, Puma Punku in Bolivia where they were saying that these stones must have been cut by diamond tip power tools, and then they showed Eric von Däniken making this huge leap from that to suggesting that there was actually a mothership around the Earth that sent an alien-filled capsule down to the surface to, to make this base camp, and just this wild kind of leap from one thing to another. And yet, presumably, they're producing this because they think people will actually swallow it. Why, why do you think people are ready for this? Well, I mean, I think they've been prepared through... Every single blockbuster movie that's come out for the last 10 or 15 years, I'm not saying every single one, but, you know, there is a huge percentage of sci-fi movies that have a ancient aliens twist to it. I mean, even things that you don't even think of right away, like Transformers is a good example. You know, the, the pyramids were built by, you know, the ancient Transformers in that in that movie. I mean, it's not a big part of the movie, but it's certainly there or you know, we could go on and on about the different blockbusters that have done that and TV shows and so on and so forth. Things like uh, Stargate or whatever. It's just we're just inundated with it. And so this is something that's been promoted pretty heavily by people with a lot of money for a long time. So you can't really surprise anybody with it. You know, it's not shocking to anybody. So I think that it's really paved the way that we are presented with something like this. And it's really not that much of a leap of faith because we've seen this a million times. And yet you think that people would sufficiently understand the situation. They'd say, well, no, that's fiction. This is being presented as fact. Ah, no, there's a divide between the two. But clearly there, there isn't in many people's minds. Well, I mean, it has a lot to do with the way that they're presenting the information. Ancient Aliens has a, a very, like the Zeitgeist thing, has a very authoritative um, tone to it. And 
they say this is true this mm. was found we now know this scientists now know this you know it's all extremely authoritative there's no sense in questioning what you're being told as, as a blatant fact and of course all those quote unquote facts prove their theory so the question is really about people's uh, discernment and their their decisions to check up on those facts that's really the issue is that we're kind of apathetic to it but there's power with as we discussed already that authoritative idea that sort of in many cases prevents it but i would say it's it's even more deep than that in that this ancient astronaut theory gives people what in their hearts of hearts already want romans 3 talks about how we're all in rebellion against god naturally and if we are indeed in rebellion against god and we want to do our own thing anything that gives us an intellectual way out mm is something that we desire, something that we want. I've heard it so many times from people saying, I want to believe this. It's a desire for me to believe this. And that's at the heart of it, I think, is that people are grasping at something th like this because it gives them the chance to be their own king, to intellectually wash their hands of God and to and to be done with it in their minds. Mm. Can I uh, ask you about the David Icke movie that you did? One thing which struck me in particular about that video was the clear evidence you present that his ideas owe a great deal to theosophy, and in particular the teachings of Alice Bailey, although I think from what you said he, he doesn't openly acknowledge that influence. And you make the point that a major part of her vision was precisely this new world order, which Ike claims that he's exposing and in opposition to. So that seems on the surface like a contradiction. Can you explain what's going on there? Sure. You know, that idea about Alice Bailey is nothing that I set out to do when deciding to debunk David Icke. I was just going to go through his claims. I was just going to learn about the stuff that he was talking about. I had never anticipated uh, this connection to Alice Bailey, but it just became very apparent in his early books that he was promoting doctrines that were very specific to Alice Bailey, the things like the, the seven rays and uh, other issues that were very, very, very specific to her. And to see how they progressed over time and his doctrine and his, his views on things was very interesting. But to make a long story short, a big part of what Alice Bailey taught through this, um, what she believed to be a, uh, what she called an ascended master, which is very popular in uh, theosophy, this a spirit being that talked to her through channeling. And particularly, I think that she was in direct contact, probably some sort of possession by this being who called himself Dejwakul. Of course, you know, demons are wont to lie about their identities. But nevertheless, she believed his name was Dejwakul. And he told her all kinds of stuff about the plan, as she referred to it, which um, mostly had to do with some future figure called the world teacher and this new world order that would set her and others in motion to begin to prepare for. She has a quote here about the new world order. She says, the new world order must meet the immediate need and not be an attempt to satisfy some distant idealistic vision. The new world order must be appropriate to a world which has passed through a destructive crisis and to a humanity which is badly shattered by the experience. The New World Order must lay the foundation for a future world order, which will be possible only after a time of recovery, of reconstruction and rebuilding. So what she wants to do here is basically kind of like a Treaty of Versailles situation. When when Hitler took power, it was in the midst of a great deal of suffering and people that had been burdened by um, all these you know, reparations or whatever was happening post World War One, and that's she constantly talks about that. And this is how it's going to sort of take place. And she's got very specific ideas about the New World Order and that it should be done in a particular way. Ike's, of course, thing is very anti the New World Order, but I think the issue is that what he is ultimately saying uh, the New World Order is and what freedom from the New World Order looks like is exactly what she defines as the new world order itself. So, for example, she describes all these things that Ike is fighting as the precursors to her new world order. And what he is saying that we should be looking forward to, this grand moment when the sun turns us all into enlightened beings and there's no more wars and there is this opportunity for us to evolve and there's going to be some people that can't evolve because they're not ready to evolve 
that's the thing that she talks about as the New World Order, in which there will have to be genocides and other things in the context of this. what David is referring to as an enlightened, great, wonderful period that just needs some some cleaning up that's necessary. So it's it's a mess. It's a definition problem, I think. Uh, and so when you take when you take away the definitions, you start to see that what he is promoting and what she is promoting are one and the same. And do you think he himself is just confused on this matter? Do you think he's deceived spiritually by this? Or do you think he's actually de- deliberately lying about all this? I think that he is genuine when he says he's had these um, – a big part of his testimony or story is that he has been uh, possessed in, in a real way by these beings that are making him do the things that he's doing. That is going out and teaching this doctrine. Mm on a world stage that's his own view of this that it's supernatural knowledge that has come to him all the books that he's written have been by automatic writing in most cases in some cases anyway through channeling through spirit contact through direct spirit contact he calls it the the voice in your head will just tell him what to do in so many cases even his most recent books he he can't he he says that he gets this information from them directly so you know he goes to peru he has this experience where these things for five hours talk to him tell him what to do and stuff like that and he does it and the thing is is that in that scenario if if it's true that he's dealing with a real supernatural being what you and i would probably referred to as a demon and basic demonology going back to the sumerians is that these things are much more brilliant than us and they know us rather well they know that our weakness is pride us being the the guy who's going to save the world is going to change the world man we'll fall for anything as long as we get to be neo right you know we're the one the only the true one wow i always thought i was special now this confirms it mm. so that's really what this is about. The same thing you can see with Jordan Maxwell. They told him they were Pleiadians and he's here to change the world and so on and so forth. When you have that kind of pride complex going on, you'll do anything and you're a true believer the whole time. Just just basic psychology that they're playing on. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why I started this podcast is that I am concerned that the truth movement has been hijacked by New Age thinking. And I've always found that deeply ironic because you know, while opposing moves towards a dictatorial, possibly dictatorial new world order, global government, whatever you want to call it, so many people seem to be embracing this new age thought, which I think at its root is committed really to precisely some form of new world order, global government. So why is it do you think that people are falling for this deception? Well, you're right in that the basis for what what we're calling the new age, that there is a new age coming but right there in the name and that new age whether people think it's going to happen because of galactic alignment or because the age of Aquarius or because of a pole shift or because of the, uh, uh, you know, there's a million different reasons why truthers, you know, that, that don't on the surface call themselves new age or whatever, yet they have some version of why we're expected to go into a new age. You know, we're going to go through a photon belt in the 26,000 years, all these different things that people say. Well, None of those are true, and you know you could see in lots of different ways. That, and David Icke debunked. I go through many of them. Uh, David Icke believes that the sun is going to put out some these seven rays of Alice Bailey, and they're going to change our DNA and turn us into enlightened beings. Just really nonsensical ideas that everybody has contradictory views of. That idea that there's a coming new age has a, in my view, a specific purpose, and that's why at the genesis of all this, when you go back to the people that started the new age concepts. Uh, such as the channelers like Alice Bailey. We'll mention Dar- Barbara Marks Hubbard and these people that were – that even today, people that say to you, look, I didn't write this book. Somebody wrote it through me. I think you know, in most cases, they're telling you the truth. I believe that that is a, a, a real thing. And most of those books where people are talking or genuinely telling you and it's probably true that some spirit being wrote this through them, those are the same books that are intensely seductive. They are like, wow, this is – brilliant this is amazingly intellectual when you read stuff like you know a course in miracles or or these kinds of channel material or you know all these different things you're like wow this is good stuff you know or uh alice bailey's stuff or or helena blavatsky or whatever it's this crafty deception that sounds so good on the surface and it it, it also has that blavatsky is a good example of that the way that she says things so authoritatively that it challenges you not to look it up because it sounds like such a proven fact she says well tacitus says so and so on and so forth 
Yeah, well, one one of the things that I noticed when I looked into theosophy was about 20 years ago, and I read some, I think it was some of Blavatsky's work and some other authors as well, sort of satellite authors, you know. One of the things that came to me was that sort of sense of I understood these things, and I got a bit of a buzz out of that. You know, I, I was a Christian, but I'd, I'd read some of these things, and there was that feeling of, oh, well, I understand these. I know I understand them to be false, but I never, I nevertheless understand them, but other people walking around in the town don't understand them. So it was even me as a Christian was being influenced slightly by that feeling that this esoteric knowledge was something special and making me special. <laughs> yeah, it's right back to the Garden of Eden. You know, no, ye not. You know, you want to know some secret knowledge that's available for you. Oh, but God doesn't want you to know it. You know, it's it's the most seductive thing that I think we can be tempted with. The idea of secret knowledge and this elitism that develops from it. All the New Age guys, they encourage this elitist thought. Oh, you know it. The sheeple don't, you know, and it is. I see it all the time in this sort of conspiracy Christian counterculture, especially those that that may have intellectually come to that place where they say, OK, yeah, this Jesus really is the way, you know, it, and the new age isn't. They've just made that intellectual point, but they have decided to sort of, if you will, just sort of change lines, not really make any kind of decision about following Christ or anything that would actually affect the way that they Mm. You know, operate. Th- those people are so in danger of this this new elitism in the so-called Christian world. They're so in danger of the false teaching because Satan has a lot more working here in the in the so-called Christian world than he ever did in the New Age. There are people that are false teaching stuff. Oh, didn't you know this thing about the Bible and this thing? You know, we're the super se- secret elite group that only know the truth about the Bible and. He is a genius at that stuff. And that's the stuff that the Bible says, look, you know, it it warns us about those people much more than it ever has anything to say about the New Age guys. It says Satan is really at work here uh, because that's where it gets really close to the truth. To make a long story short, the elitist view of the of theosophy and everything, the way they sell everything is through elitism. And that's why humility, genuine humility, is your best weapon against the false teachings and the false deceptions that are out there. If you can be truly humble, you can you can be protected from ninety eight percent of what Satan has to throw at you. And there is one tendency that I noticed with the, the truth movement as we call it. So I mean just just thinking of say nine eleven truth that it's possible to get into the same kind of psychological state with that and think to yourself, I've come to look at this evidence and reach the conclusion that we've not been told the truth about it and all the people around me, well, they're still within that old paradigm of not realizing that we've been lied to. And so there's a bridge there, it seems to me. Yeah, it's true. And and I think I kind of softened up on that when I realized that, you know, most of this kind of stuff, most of the the occultists and the new age people that constitute much of the people in the new in the truth movement all these gurus and personalities they're doing way a way better job of telling people about 9-11 and and stuff than than i am and you know i i think i realized that satan doesn't care if you know that 9-11 is inside job or not you know it just serves his purpose ultimately i mean i'm not saying I, i certainly believe that it was an inside job but i'm just saying it just really downgrades the importance of that in your in your intellectual, you know, library. I, I think that true Christians that are aware of the Bible, that are students of the Bible, they're not shocked at nine eleven truth or whatever. I loved that. I love seeing like talking to an old lady or something. I have this one in mind that she she doesn't know about the New World Order or what, whatever, but we are both on the same page as far as, you know, love the Bible and read it all the time and really understand. We could basically like brother and sister there. We're thinking the same things. And I was mentioned one day about the New World Order and some of the issues in 9-11 or whatever. And she didn't bat an eye. It's like, oh, yeah, well, that makes sense. Right. <laughs> it's just not yeah. it's not a, for her. It's not going to be a big shock because, of course, the Bible tells you that, hey, this kind of stuff is going on all the time. They're behind the scenes preparing for all kinds of bad stuff and, and deceiving people and so on. I think a lot of people have trouble with that kind of thing because they think that human nature is essentially good, which, of course, the uh, the Bible tells us that is not the case, that we're very much mixed bags in that respect. Yeah, very true. Um, this brings me to the, the last thing I wanted to ask you about, your movie, The New Age and its relationship to the Antichrist. Now, this is a subject that has interested me for quite a few years, I guess about 20 years or so since I first encountered the existence of the New Age and read about theosophy and the like. And as you say in your movie, it's very difficult to define this new age because it's it's not an organization. It's it's not a single body of beliefs, but you do point to a core of beliefs. Can you just give a kind of short list of what those are? Hmm. Well, I don't have it in front of me, but I would say off the top of my head, I would mention 
the idea, as we mentioned, that there is a coming new age, uh, that, that we are about to approach it, and that once we get there, things will be vastly different. Some form of occultism, and this can be a broad spectrum of it, but the idea um, of occult practice of some sort, not always in, in any kind of high degree, uh, usually just something like meditation or Unfortunately, I don't have that list in front of me. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's fine. Um, but you trace the the roots of this new age, these new age like beliefs. I can't say the new age because, as you you say, people have these various beliefs under different names. So new age like beliefs go back. You trace it back to the Gnostics, I believe, in the second century AD, maybe even the first century AD, and then you trace those ideas through European mysticism and occultism up to Madame Blavatsky in the nineteenth century, and then on especially through Alice Bailey in the early 20th century. And some of the quotes that you get from her writings make this very good case that her vision is for this new world order that you've already said. And it fits really quite neatly with this future world order of the Antichrist, which we see prophesied in the New Testament. Now, I know this is, again, probably another unfair question. There's a lot to ask of you again, but could you explain that connection? Right. Well... This is the concept, and I think this is, as you said, very neat. And I want to preface this by saying that that particular video, The New Age and its relationship to the Antichrist, I think is sort of my thesis statement on if this is how it goes down. And I was just interviewing Michael Heiser, and I uh, read his book recently as a fictional book about the facade. And it was amazing to see, like, 12 years ago, him writing this book. And it was almost identical, and for the identical reasons that I had said in this new age and its relationship to the Antichrist, that how this deception could work. What I'm trying to say is that it's, I think, a really good human answer to the question of how this could all shake down. But I'll explain maybe a little later that I'm not so sure, after all, it will go down exactly like this. But I like having it out there because I still hold out the possibility that it's very, very possible because it would be perfect if the Antichrist did do it. Um, anyway, the basics is that, of course, the idea of a leader of this sort that could convince the world somehow or another that a new age had indeed dawned and that there were great opportunities for us in this, notably uh, as Alice Bailey had said there earlier, that if we could get to a place where – I'll just kind of summarize it. If we can get to a place where everybody is so badly shattered by war that you could propose a system that would have no more war, but it would have to be something pretty significant. The essential idea is that if you could show the world that God didn't exist, that the Bible was a complete myth and, and untrue – which I, I would propose one of many ways could be through some sort of alien unveiling or some kind of thing that would quote unquote prove extraterrestrial existence, even though I would argue that that doesn't prove that God doesn't exist. It certainly in the court of public opinion would go that way. And it would be such an amazing thing that it would spread around the world in no time. Everybody in two days would know, hey, extraterrestrial life landed on the White House lawn or whatever, whatever version of that is. They found it on Mars or whatever. Then everybody would unanimously agree, okay, well, Christianity is wrong, and so is Judaism, and so is Islam, and that's the key point. The world could so easily be convinced, and I think that the, if you will, the New World Order is is banking on this, encouraging and funding the wars that the public views as a war against Jews and Muslims and Christians because they have to support the Jews. And if we ever go through a world war, which is based on the you know Israel connection the, and the Muslim neighbors and Christians getting involved— then the shattering aspect of that at the end of that, when all the dust settles, it will be very easy for somebody to say, look, all of our wars are because we are following this outdated book that we all know now is wrong. The book isn't true, and yet we're all still fighting. If we could abandon this book and this God, then we would also abandon our wars because, after all, all the wars are because of this false religious belief. Mm. And that is in the, in, the, in the channeled literature and everything else exactly what is meant by when we get into that age that the old people that are stuck in the old age are those that can't let go of this idea of Jesus in the age of Pisces. And those people must be dealt with. Let me just read from Barbara Marks Hubbard as she says, Out of the full spectrum of humanity, one-fourth is electing to transcend. One-fourth is resisting to election. They are unattracted to life ever-evolving. Now, as we approach the quantum shift from creature-human to 
co-creative human, the destructive one-fourth must be eliminated from the social body. Fortunately, you, dearly beloveds, are not responsible for this act. We are. We are in charge of God's selection process for the planet Earth. He selects. We destroy. We are the writers of the pale horse death. Um, there are many quotes like this that essentially say that those who won't evolve or choose not to evolve must be eliminated in order for the others to be evolved. So it gives an incentive program, which I think fits neatly into the probably the primary warning of Jesus and the about the end times was of a genocide that would be so great, as he says, people will think that they're doing God's service when they kill you. And I also did a, a short video called How Enlightenment Will Lead to Genocide. Enlightenment. This is, again, this kind of theosophical enlightenment. Right, yeah. How how the idea of enlightenment will lead to genocide or how it could. But let me just say that though I think this idea would be great, like, you know, the alien connection would do so many different things. It would make people abandon God. It would give us this thing like Dawkins, you know, that we all can be evolved. It would actually make the New Age doctrine make sense to everybody, not just the New Agers, because mm. all of a sudden, hey, we can evolve. Here are some evolved beings standing right in front of us. That means that they created, they're telling us the way they created us or whatever way. And we are we are therefore, it's possible for us to become like them. We, we are at a transition process or right now. Yeah, I, I can see how that would seem to work, but it seems rather too extravagant to pull it off. Well, this is the thing. I can make that work in my head. I could, I could like, you know, be an advisor to Satan and say, Satan, this really would be the way to go because, you you know, it covers all your bases. And it's really, I think that's why it has so much power. But the problem is, is that when I was doing a study of Revelation 17 and 18, the Mystery Babylon passages, mm-hmm. And subsequently have been doing a lot of study about the Antichrist and Daniel. I'm in a study of Daniel right now trying to figure it all out. I just don't see that. Uh, In fact, I see something that is so different, so impossible, that the only reason I would ever submit it is because it's just blatantly there in the text. And that is that the Antichrist won't be a buddy-buddy to everybody universalist thing, but a, a man who will present himself as the Jewish Messiah to the nation of Israel and that they will embrace him as such and that the world believes that their Messiah has come. It speaks of the world is made drunk by the fierceness of her fornication with the Antichrist. She falls for him so hard and she calls him her husband, her king, that the world is sort of entranced by her fornication, this great abomination that she does that is embracing Satan as opposed to their rightful king. But I could go on to many different things. The Antichrist, we know, sits in the temple in Jerusalem and declares himself to be God. And the idea is that, you know, that defiles the temple. Well, it certainly does defile the temple, but not in the way that people think. The problem is that I think it says people embrace it. People like it. People like that he's claiming to be their Messiah returned. They've been waiting for that for a long time, and everybody else has as well. I think it's a perfect setup for a lot of different reasons. It's the exact opposite of the reason I like the the alien sort of New Age view, is because that view I can see happening right where we're at. But the one that I see in Scripture, I I can't make a case for, except for, like I said, it seems to be unquestionably true in Scripture. What you said before was it could be possible that there would be some sort of world war. Wouldn't that be a sufficient kind of chaotic situation that would precipitate this move into the new world order? Right. The war is transcendent in both of those views. The the war is what I see in Daniel, latter half of Daniel 11 and in Revelation 13. The Antichrist, contrary to this idea of uh, him being a peacemaker, is a war maker. He is a guy who comes on the scene conquering with a sword and conquering well. Who can make war with the beast is the cry of the people in the book of Revelation. And as we see in Daniel, just moving and, and sweeping over vast, uh, you know, his enemies in battle. So that is what I see. That is the first thing that must happen is is a tremendous amount of war in which somehow or another, when the dust settles, we will be looking at, like I mentioned, the Treaty of Versailles situation. Um, But yes, it's somehow or another going to center around that. But whatever happens after, just like Alice Bailey said, we are prepped in that vulnerability for whatever comes next. There's one more question I wanted to ask you, which I was going to ask you a little earlier, but I didn't manage to get it in, so I will ask it now. One thing I was struck by what you said in the movie, that rather than seeing this new age phenomenon as a a single 
conspiracy here in the material realm. You said something along the lines, it's best to understand it as conspiracy in the spiritual realm, essentially a demonic conspiracy against God and his purposes. And it just so happens the New Age thinking fits. It's a perfect tool for that purpose. And you pointed to a couple of evidences suggesting this demonic connection. You talked about channeling and the phenomenon of so-called alien abductions. So could you explain how particularly the alien abductions business fits into this? In terms of this conspiracy, I think it's best to look at it like this military system in the spiritual world with different rankings and so on. The New Age and its practices, particularly its getting people to open up to the occult, essentially creates players on the field for this spiritual agenda. Their agenda, plain and simple, is to build up a system, a throne, if you will, for the Antichrist. That They're under orders, and that's how it goes. That They, of course, want to be in places of power, the military. They want to influence those types of people and things like that. But they've always been in the business of promoting the ideology of the situation and stuff like that. Anytime somebody gives them an open doorway to the degree that they open themselves up through things that the Bible says, don't do this because it will defile you through occult practice, they then begin to say, hey, you know, we are so-and-so and such-and-such, please write this book for us. And so they're trying to prep and to get people on the board with and everything all leading up to their phoenix. That's what this is all about. The infrastructure, the ideology, everything is to to prep the world for their antichrist. That's the agenda. Everybody else is just tools. Alien abduction, that's sort of a, I would say, more of a symptom of somebody that has tremendous open doors in their life. And it certainly has been used for part of the ideology that is people they're told this doctrine and they're told to go back and tell people about it or whatever and it sort of gives validation to this idea of the the aliens and so on and so forth and very often those people have already been involved in the occult in some way yeah in fact john mack sort of pioneered this when he noticed that in doing his study at harvard about all these people with alien abductions that there was a disproportionate amount of people that were extremely into the occult like very into the occult so he actually came up with a survey that he called revised paranormal belief scale i think it was paranormal belief scale at the time anyway it asked questions like do you believe in black magic and so on and so forth And they were trying to quantify, if you will, what they were observing, which is that all these people that are having this are also extremely into the occult. Now, even to this day in things like sleep paralysis and stuff, they will admit that paranormal belief is an extreme correlate to people that are having a huge amount of alien abduction or sleep paralysis. They haven't gone far enough, though. They've just essentially dealt with the fact that they believe it, but it's not their belief that has anything to do with it. It's their practice of the occult phenomenon. And one of the studies that I've just got done completing the the surveys at a website I've got called sleepsurvey.org. We've had 13 or so people fill out a questionnaire of more than 90 questions about these kinds of things, taking this idea that, okay, yeah, you're all into you all believe in paranormal stuff. But what specifically are you doing and how much are you having sleep paralysis? And we have found a tremendous link between occult practice and severe sleep paralysis so the same people that are saying i have sleep paralysis or or i'm in in contact with these beings that are torturing me and so on forth every night every other night those kinds of extreme sort of version those are the same people that are saying oh yeah i do occult practice this much this much and this much and we've got a huge list of the different things that they do so to answer the question yes so anyway it's symptomatic of of that anyway there is a lot of stuff that i think that we as seekers of the truth and the truth movement would do better in trying to figure out what the agenda is if we stop hacking at the branches and start realizing that, yes, if these guys are Satanists at the top levels that are really the movers and shakers of this, you know, we need to consider that they are essentially pawns in a spiritual game. And if that's so, you know, there's some more research that we could do at that point. And that's what I would encourage. I would really welcome, even if it wasn't a particularly Christian, you know, research, but if they were recognizing that and recognizing that this is something that we see experientially in the research of who these people are and what they're into and the kind of things that they say, then therefore would, would make a whole lot more sense. You know, there is a extreme anti-Christian bias from the very same people that are telling us to get into the occult and stuff like that. It, that's just nonsensical. You wouldn't accept that you wouldn't put a fox in charge of the hen house. And that's essentially what we've done with, where we get our knowledge about uh, Jesus and Christianity and the Bible from occultists. 
So we were in a big truth war in that regard. And regardless of what people believe about the followership of Jesus Christ, whether or not we should believe that he is God and that he is worthy of our devotion and followership, we should at least be able to weed out what is and isn't true about the Bible and Christianity and God, because those are uh, important things not to hold purely wrong beliefs about, which most of us in the quote-unquote truth movement do. It's it, You took a poll, I'm sure everybody would say, oh yeah, Horace was the same as Jesus, and so was Krishna. And that's that's just plainly wrong, regardless of what you want. You actually think most people in the truth movement would say that? Oh, I, I would think so. Mm. The Zeitgeist movie is getting people into the truth movement. Most people are born into the truth movement through the Zeitgeist movie. Its numbers are through the roof. I mean, it's you can't even quantify it anymore. It's 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 too big. Uh, how how many people have watched it? But if you compare that movie to stuff like The God Who Wasn't There or whatever, it's it's just nothing. It's it's such a monster out there. So yeah, I I would venture that to say that most people do, but but we would have to do the study to see it. Yeah, sure. But you are sort of confirming the vibes that I've been getting about this when I said, you know, I started this podcast because I was very concerned about this. And you seem to be telling me that, well, yeah, this is probably even more the case than I thought in the first place. Yeah, it's unfortunate that I think that we in the truth movement ultimately are, are doing more harm than good. And the problem is, like I said, if we don't know who the New World Order is and what their agenda ultimately is, then it doesn't do any good to fight them. Because you might very well be doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. If you're listening to David Icke every day and you're doing what he's telling you to do to fight the New World Order and reading the books that he's telling you to read, then you are doing the most dangerous thing and the most beneficial thing for the New World Order if what I'm saying is true. The question is if, because if what I've just said or any part of what I've just said or a significant part of what I just said is true, then we are all in grave danger. And in many of your works, you make sure that you end with the the good news, don't you? I mean, you, you, a lot of what we'd be discussing here is this the really bad news, but you end consistently, from what I've seen, with the good news about Jesus Christ, which is absolutely the right thing to do. That's what we're here for, isn't it? To share this great news that we can all be saved in Christ. You obviously see your work as a ministry. Is that right? Very much so, yes. It's really important to me to do that. And so it's I consider a very important part of what I do to answer and help new Christians. I mean, two days of, of the week I spend, you know, 12 or so hours just doing audio responses and trying to help people that have questions about this stuff. That's the important part of what this is, is the trying to make disciples of all men and trying to do those things that are necessary to building us all up in Christ. And, of course, things like David Icke debunked are, are more or less evangelistic in nature. But, you know, I think it's also a discipleship thing for a lot of people to sort of understand if indeed it's true how the world works or how it could all play out. And some of your websites have a very clear statement that this is missionary work, but not all of them do, do they? Do you want to just list through what websites you have? Because you have an enormous number now, don't you? Sure. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the main podcast site is nowhere to run radio.com that's sort of the podcast that sort of started it all and that's kind of the hub for most of this kind of stuff i also do um ancient aliens debunk that one is one that's not overtly christian in nature that was intended more as a declaration of war against the ancient astronaut theory and you said you would actually, if the evidence was there, you, you would quite happily accept that we were visited by aliens in the past. Indeed. I think that Michael Heiser, who appears in that movie, makes a strong case that it's not antithetical to the Christian worldview. It doesn't have to be anyway. But we don't, at this point, the idea is moot in that none of the evidence presented for extraterrestrials and that I've seen is necessarily explainable by extraterrestrials. Most of it's just technology based and some of it is other stuff that we could discuss. But but I don't see any evidence, uh, nor does Heiser, that it that we actually have to deal with that. But verse by verse, uh, Bible teaching is, is basically just what it says. Verse by verse, Bible teaching. Stop sleep paralysis, which is evangelistic in nature. It's trying to help people that are experiencing uh, sleep paralysis, which is sort of a lower form of alien abduction, which is this demonic attack, basically, as people open themselves up to uh, cult practices. And there's various other things that can open them up, which I won't go into now. But uh, just pointing them to the Lord and DVD tract, the 2012 deception, Bible prophecy stuff, various other websites, the Zeitgeist Challenge, as you mentioned. What was what's the DVD tract one? The DVD tract was something I did really early on when I first got saved just to make gospel presentations of video presentations where I would put them on DVDs and then just 
hand them out and and really just put them all over my town. Like I write watch me or something on them and uh, would just leave them in gas station pumps and stuff <laughs> like that. So so sort of a way to get people to take a coherent explanation of the gospel home. A lot of people don't like really being approached anymore about things because of cultural issues and so on. So uh, so the idea was to get them a home where they could be comfortable and hear and understand the gospel. And you're still giving away that DVD, aren't you, if people want to contact you? Yeah, that one. And most of the ones that I give away are called Christianity 101 DVDs. They are uh, material that I have thought was really helpful for people. I've put eight gigabytes of audio and video and things that I think are helpful for uh, new believers. So it's just a data disc that I send out free of charge all over the world. Really excited about that particular project. I've been sending them out to countries everywhere and really hoping that that's uh, doing good out there. Well, thanks ever so much for your time. It's been a very, very interesting interview, and uh, it's great. Thanks for for spending all this time with me, and I think that uh, if people have been listening carefully, their minds will be probably swirling with all the information that you've given. So uh, thanks very much indeed for all your patience with my questions. Thank you, Julian. It was a really pleasant interview.